Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's, pro today's program. I'm Patty Sherman Sisler, the Executive Director with the Jewish Museum Milwaukee, and we are thrilled that you're here to join us today for a presentation and virtual book talk on an independent spirit, the quiet, generous life of he Helen Daniels Bader. I ask for your patience if there are any technical difficulties today. If you do have a problem, you can go to the bottom of your screen and there's a chat button and someone with our programming department will try to help you. Also, as we go through the program, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, put those in the chat button uh, and we will come back to those at the end of the presentation. Um, we are so honored to present this program. Bader Philanthropies, as we all know, is generous in spirit and in resources. They've aided our, our community in so many ways and in so mat many matters of importance and relevance. Largely because of Helen Daniels Bader, the SPARK program was initiated. This program to me is near and dear to my heart. SPARK is a program of associated museums and community organizations that program for people with memory loss. And it has been my privilege to work at three museums that have offered uh, SPARK programming, including the Jewish Museum Milwaukee, where we can see what happens when dance, music, visual arts, history, cooking, and camaraderie combine. So thank you to the Baders. Thank you to Priscilla for the book in sharing this incredible story with the community. Uh, just a little more on how to get the best view today. If you are seeing Brady Bunch style, you can go up to your upper right hand corner and, spe and press speaker view. That way you will see the person who is speaking at any given time. To kick off this afternoon, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Dan Bader, President and CEO of Bader Philanthropies. Dan was the founding CEO of the Helen Bader Foundation in 1992. Today, he works closely with the entire board of directors and sets organizational direction and long-term strategy, which, um, which guide the foundation's goals and their culture. He serves on several local, national, and global boards, including the Greater Milwaukee Committee for Community Development, Relief International, and Rogers Behavioral Health Systems. In 2006, UW Milwaukee confirmed an honorary degree, of a doctorate degree of humane letters in recognition of his work to improve quality of life. And in 2019, Cardinal Stritch University also conferred a Doctor of Humane Letters in recognition of his daily commitment and active engagement and enduring investment in our community and around the world. Um, we are thrilled to welcome the Baders and um, please welcome Dan Bader. Thank you so much, Patty. It's really great to be here this afternoon with you. And, and I wanna really thank the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee for the partnership that we've had with you uh, over the many years. <clears throat> we have um, been really delighted to work with the museum and, and all the programs and projects that have occurred over the years. And uh, I know that uh, you've got a lot planned at the museum for the next uh, 12 months and, and several years. So we look forward to seeing all the good works that you do as well. You know, when I think about, um, this book and I think about the foundation, uh, you know, in essence, what the foundation is all about is really carrying out my mother's spirit and trying to see the beauty in people and encouraging everyone to be their best self. And what we're going to hear today is um, stories about my mother, Helen Daniels Bader, from two people who knew her well as a mother and an aunt. The conversation is going to be facilitated by our author, Priscilla Perdini, who will weave countless conversation stories and hundreds of photos to bring this book 
and Independent Spirit, The Quiet, Generous Life of Helen Daniels Bader. Before we get into our program, I'd just like to give a few introductions. David Bader is sort of obviously my brother and also Helen Bader's older son. David is also Vice President of Bader Philanthropies and Director of our board. David is a proud father of four of Helen's grandchildren. David is a registered architect working in Eastern Pennsylvania. He is also president of Fat Badger Bakery, an online vegan cookie company located in Pipersville, Pennsylvania. David holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's degree in architecture from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He has also studied sculpture and drawing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Art in Philadelphia. David follows his father's passions for old master paintings and enjoys attending fine art, art auctions and studying Northern Baroque art history. And David also follows his mother's passion for cooking and is a chef extraordinaire. Deirdre Britt is my cousin and Helen's niece. Still, Deirdre Britt serves as chair for the Helen Daniels Bader Advisory Committee, as well as our board secretary. The niece of Helen Bader, Deirdre, is actively involved in visual arts and has served with a number of community arts nonprofits. She holds a bachelor's degree from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and a master's degree in the fine arts from the University of Hawaii. Her business backgrounds includes positions as a business marketing manager and creative manager for Hallmark Cards in Kansas City. Deirdre currently resides in Chicago. And finally, and definitely not least, of course, is our wonderful author, Priscilla Pardini. She um, is an uh, author and editor based in Milwaukee and former education mm -hmm. reporter for the Milwaukee Journal. She is the author of several books, including Women Making a Difference, American Association of University Women in Milwaukee, 1894 to 2012, and the Faye McBeath Foundation, A Story of Giving, which won the Wilmer Shields Rich Award for Excellence in Communication. Her other works include On Her Own, a, The Life of the Friend, a biography for the children about the philanthropist for whom the city's Children's Museum and Children's Room at the Milwaukee Public Library are named. So we hope you enjoy this afternoon's program and walk away inspired by an extraordinary multifaceted woman, my mom, a citizen of many worlds and cultures, but yet comfortable in all of them and always have a smile on her face and a sense of dignity and compassion for all human beings. It is my pleasure to turn the afternoon over to Priscilla. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, my goal in writing Helen's biography was to tell her story within the context of the time, the place, and um, the interactions that affected her life. And I also felt it was important to write an unvarnished account of the life of a real person. And so I was very gratified, um, Dan, when you and David encouraged me um, to tell the honest story of your mother's life. My research began when your brother, Deirdre, that would be Alan DeVay, um, presented me with a beautiful copy of the Daniels DeVay uh, family tree, um, along with some supplemental backup documentation, and which I just, which, which I went on then to augment with um, Aberdeen newspaper archives going back, um, oh, to the late 1800s. Um, photos and documents from the Daniels DeVay family archives and a series of video interviews that um, were produced shortly after Helen's death by what was then the Helen Bader Foundation. And, and that included um, video interviews with your parents, Deirdre, and um, your father, um, Dan and David. Um, I learned that Helen's ancestors emigrated from England and Germany and traveled west from Connecticut, New York, and Virginia to what was then the very rugged Dakota Territory, a place known for very harsh living conditions that included unending cycles of drought, floods, blizzards, and insect infestations. Um, their ancestors were pioneers. They established a trading post. They uh, were fur traders. They interacted with the local Chippewa. They fought in the Civil War, and they farmed the land. Um, these were strong, tough people. And Deirdre, uh, right from the beginning of this project, um, you uh, talked with me about the impact 
that those pioneers and the hardship they endured um, had on your mother and your Aunt Helen, um, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Priscilla. Um, my mother was uh, inordinately proud of the fact that her family had pioneers in it, actual pioneers, real pioneers, um, and that branches of the family had gone even further west than the Great Plains to settle, uh, that they were farmers, that they lived from the land. Um, she was very proud of that tradition. And she and my Aunt Helen definitely grew up um, with the backdrop of the great prairies. Um, you know, Aberdeen was a small rail city, small town. Um, it was really on the map because the railroads went through there. Um, so banking and commerce followed. But um, all their lives, I know both sisters reflected that sort of sense of coming from the prairie and coming from pioneers. And it, it was extraordinary, really. Um, David, um, could you talk about your reaction uh, to, to, first of all, finding out that one of your great-great-grandfathers, that would be John Sidney Allen, um, had survived skirmishes with the Chippewa and a shipwreck off of the Florida Keys only to be murdered years later in his own barn in Red Wing, Minnesota. And, and then secondly, um, you're actually just seeing a photo of John Allen's wife, Teresa Gaylord Allen. Um, yeah, thank you for forcing me to learn about my great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather. I really wouldn't have known anything about him. And he sounds like a real pioneer and a real ruffian. So, um, that makes sense. But then I, I looked at the photograph of him and his wife, Teresa, who you can see on the left. <clears throat> and I see the smile and I can almost hear her voice because that mischievous look is one that my mother has and uh, I have inherited and my daughter Helen has inherited. And so thank you very much for that. I guess I would never have looked very closely at Teresa. And now I see where this great expression is coming from. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Beautiful photos. Um, so then if we um, if we fast forward to Aberdeen, um, just after the turn of the century, uh, your your great your great great grandparents have settled there. Um, and that would be George and Leonia Mabbitt. Um, traditionalists pretty much, highly respected, um, socially prominent. Uh, George sold insurance. He was a civic leader. And then um, on the other side of the family, we have Joe and Pearl Daniels, um, who embodied Aberdeen's more, should we say, forward-looking uh, can-do spirit. Joe was really a popular guy in town, and he worked for the railroad for many years, which, as you said, Deirdre, was key to um, Aberdeen's development. Um, but then he went on to speculate in real estate and despite being a railroad man, uh, also sold um, automobiles later in his life. Your grandmother, Jessie Mabbitt, was smart as a whip um, and quite feisty as a young woman. Uh, and she was the very first in the family to go to college. And that would have been at Milwaukee Downer in 1915, which was quite unusual. Um, your grandfather, Lloyd Daniels, was a beloved pharmacist who ran Daniels Drugs for 40 years. Uh, they marry, they, they are engaged and they marry in 1919. And two years later, Marjorie, um, your mother Deirdre is born. And six years later on May 20th, 1927, the day that Charles Lindbergh landed in Paris on the first transatlantic flight, um, Helen is born. And even early on, she begins displaying her ind independent spirit uh, on a theme that would define her life. Um, she was a tomboy, she hated wearing dresses, and she was never happier than when she was uh, wearing her blue jeans and riding her bicycle. Um, of course, um, Marjorie and Helen's childhood was largely defined by the Depression, um, an era that was also known as the Dirty Thirties um, on the Great Plains, again, because these natural disasters you know, were unending. And again, um, we see the dust storms, the drought, the grasshoppers that continue to plague the region. Um, 
so times times were hard and um, yet there were also some happy memories such as life at Daniel's Drugs. And I'm just gonna read a few short, short excerpts um, from the book. Um, during the dirty thirties, um, it is said, farm women mostly swept up dust. But Marjorie recalled that many Aberdonian women did, did so as well. The first thing every morning, the grasshoppers were in the front door of the store, she said, where everything was covered with dust. In fact, all of Aberdeen's main street merchants were struggling. Yet Lloyd refused to give up or give in to the harsh economic realities, routinely working 19 hour days to keep the store afloat and build his business. It wasn't unusual for him to go back to the store late at night if someone needed a prescription filled. If anybody had a sick baby out in the country, he'd take it to them, recalled Marjorie. Lloyd also refused to turn away customers who couldn't afford their prescriptions, including the destitute farmers and local Sioux who lived outside of town and were especially devastated by the economic downturn. According to Deirdre, the American Indians typically came to the back of the pharmacy where Lloyd provided whatever they needed. Um, but like I said, there were also, um, there were also happy, happy times. I love this little anecdote. On opening day, nine-year-old Marjorie uh, walked her three-year-old sister seven blocks from their home to the store. So Helen had on a cute little dress and her cute curls, recalled Marjorie. And we walked down and walked inside and I said, now don't tell daddy that mother's making a cake. Helen promptly looked up at her father, said, daddy, get down and whispered in his ear, mother's making a big cake. <laughs> um, I, love, I love the fact that um, as Marjorie, Marjorie liked to say dear to her that she grew up behind the farm, behind the soda fountain at the store. And, uh, uh, she recalled delicious ice cream sodas in lots of flavors and served in tall frosted glasses made from farm fresh ice cream that uh, sold on ice cream soda special day for 10 cents each. Sometimes we'd keep track and we'd have five or six of us behind the counter getting in each other's way. But by the end of the day, we would have sold 200 sodas, which was a lot for an itty bitty drugstore. Um, David, you traveled uh, many, many, many summers um, with your mother and your brother um, to Aberdeen uh, on, on the train. And I just wonder if you could share with us some of your recollections of, uh, of those trips and of, of Aberdeen and your memories of Jesse and, um, and Lloyd. Well, the train trip, I, it probably happened about twice a year. And it was, it was really fun. We would leave in the morning from Milwaukee and we would ride on the Hiawatha on Milwaukee Road up to Minneapolis, my brother and I would destroy the train and, um, <clears throat> and my mother couldn't really control us. And, um, and I do remember we threw paper airplanes down from the dome car out to everybody below. So, <laughs> um, and I think I stabbed a conductor with a collapsible sword and it had water in it. And, so it was a rough experience for my mom. Then um, we would change trains in Minneapolis and we'd uh, ride on a one car train up through Minnesota to Dakota and arrive in Aberdeen at, in one in the morning. And my grandfather would be there to pick us up in his Chrysler and he'd slowly drive us back to my, to their home because he never went over 15 miles an hour. And then um, my grandma was there in her jammies and she made us Ovaltine and uh, called us deers and, and things like that. We always deers and then we, we got put to bed. So my grandfather, Lloyd, was a very quiet man. He was like an angel and um, he had his entire shop of his father's in his basement, in their basement, with all the little screws and bottles labeled and everything perfectly and the hammers and nails. And he took us down there to build us little sailboats. And then my brother and I would spend basically the rest of the week in the basement. And like we did on the train, we destroyed the basement. And then uh, we built things. And I think that's one reason I, myself and probably my cousin Daniel are builders of some sort at this point, because we, we could see that my grandfather was building things, my great grandfather, and then my grandfather taught us things. And we built things and life continues. So that was a big part of my upbringing. My, my grandmother was very concerned about 
uh, how we were doing and had a lot more energy uh, than my grandfather. At least he, she was, she was, she was always going on and um, she's always writing us letters and always very concerned about how we were doing. And they were sort of opposite of each other. And they had a beautiful little house and I would call them late Victorian and sort of their aesthetic take on life because that's kind of when they started life. And um, I kind of call it my Victorian up Protestant upbringing, that, that whole experience. Fascinating. Jerry, you you and your mother um, also took summer trips to, to Aberdeen. Um, and the local, I remember the, the local newspaper, and I, I believe the photos are in the book, ran um, ran photos of both 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 mothers with their children um, uh, various years. Um, so what tell us about your memories of Aberdeen and your grandparents and, and what traits you think they passed on to, to to their daughters. Yeah, well it was it was kind of a magical place and and um, David's right the train ride was not the least of it for, for I know I was I don't remember if I was four or five I think I was five um, and my mother and I just the two of us first took that trip out there it was really cool um, yeah my grandparents were interesting David referred to them as opposites they definitely were quite a couple um, the, uh, my grandfather was, was very kind, shy, I think, um, had a, had a sweet little sense of humor that would come out. Um, he was just so kind, such a kind man. My grandmother was, um, had the formidable intelligence, um, was definitely more outgoing. I was thinking about it um, this week and I was thinking, I never really thought about it in this, through this lens, I guess, but they really were an equal couple, which is, doesn't sound strange at all now. That's why I think I, it hadn't occurred to me really before, but looking back, um, that was very much the era, of course, where the husband is the head of the household, no questions asked, the wife, follows along and is happy to be there and whatever. Um, and while every marriage is certainly different, I look back and I think they were nothing if not fully equal partners, um, both in their home life and then in running the drugstore. And I think that's, that's, that sets a good path and a good example for Helen later, I think, when I look back. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Um, so both of your mothers then follow in your grandmother Jessie's footsteps by enrolling at Milwaukee Downer, um, which turns out ultimately to have immense uh, positive repercussions for Milwaukee and for the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Um, Helen graduates, stays in Milwaukee, where she meets and in 1952 marries um, Alfred Bader, an Austrian Jew who was evacuated from Vienna on the first kinder transport in 1938, um, first to England and then to an internment camp near Quebec City in Canada. And then overcoming very long odds, he goes on to earn a PhD in chemistry from Harvard. Um, and despite um, his quirky, often difficult and um, sometimes off-putting personality, he goes on to found um, uh, Aldrich Chemical Company, which becomes one of the most successful companies, um, chemical companies in the world at the time. Um, he becomes a leader in Milwaukee's Jewish community, and he amasses a world famous collection of old master paintings. So, you know, clearly this is a brilliant and very accomplished man. Mm -hmm. um, I found it fascinating that Helen, uh, despite having majored in botany and um, sharing her father's uh, personality trait of, of being quite shy, she goes to work at Aldrich and quickly becomes indispensable to the, um, to the operation of the, uh, of the company, both because of her calm efficiency uh, and because of her profound interest in and ability to relate to um, Aldrich's employees, a trait that your father, David, really did not share, 
Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit, David, about your parents' respective roles in growing Eldritch, um, including the importance of your mother's ability to relate to the employees and, um, and the way she ran what you guys called the, um, the Bader Hotel. <laughs> okay, um, I wasn't around, I wasn't born while the company had it was in its infancy, so I can't remember that part. Um, when I showed up and I was aware of what was going on, yeah, we did have a hotel and we had a lot of German speaking art historians and chemists and business people staying in our house. And my mother would have to cook for them and entertain them. Um, and she eventually learned German so she could even interact with them. And my father was, was very intense and, and focused on building the business and what these people had to uh, offer. And um, he would travel to Europe about twice a year in those days for about a month each time. And he would go, I would call it on buying, he'd go buying because there are a lot of smaller companies in Germany that made chemicals and they weren't made in the United States. And then he would get the drugs in and uh, the, the big quantities of chemicals would come over, which my mother was in charge of importing. And, um, and they would put them in small bottles and universities around the world would order these smaller samples for their research. So, um, that's sort of that's sort of the beginning of the business in a nutshell. My father, of course, was on a very high level. He knew his chemistry, he knew his art history, he was focused on making sure the business made money and each deal worked. And he was very intense until the day he left the plan and he was very intense. And that required my mother to be uh, more of a people person because there was an agglomeration of many different kinds of people to make this business work. There were, of course, chemists and chemists with PhDs and uh, chemists that were just had their bachelor's degree. And there were Holocaust survivors that worked in accounting and other parts of the business that had come to Milwaukee after the war and they also worked there. So they were part of the culture. And of course, the business was in uh, what we called the core. It was in the black part of Milwaukee and we had a lot of people of color working there in sort of the packing and production of, of all these different chemicals. So it was a real hodgepodge. Nobody was, um, everybody was graded in how hard they worked and if they could do their job and not by the color of their skin or their background or if they could speak English or if they were even considered, uh, there were people there that, that were called mentally challenged, right? But if they could clean bottles, they had a job. And so my mother loved them all. I don't know if she loved them all, but she was able to make them all feel at home there. And, uh, and the genius was in his office um, going over things with, nervous vice president. It's a very frenetic, frenetic place. There was always too much to do for everybody that was there. And uh, and it grew quickly. So I hope that gives you a bit of a synopsis of what our home life and my, my parents' different roles there were. So my mother's role continued like that until it became rather large place. And she even enjoyed, when I was there in my teens, she even enjoyed pointing people out to me that were very colorful. And, um, and she really enjoyed the people for what they offered as individuals. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we didn't really look down on anybody. Uh, everybody had value in yep. some format, in some special way. So looking down on people was frowned upon. Um. I, I'm just going to read uh, another short excerpt from the book um, uh, about an anecdote that took place during these early years. Um, well, actually, it was it was probably um, it was probably about um, 1970, um, uh, and this was um, this is an anecdote recounted by um, a woman named um, 
Joan Prince, who just retired as a vice chancellor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So this was back when Joan was a 15 year old high school student and she was walking one day in the neighborhood of Aldrich with her sister. And lo and behold, they come across this building that's labeled Aldrich Chemical Company. And she recalled, I loved math and science, but I thought the only thing you could do with math and science was become um, a doctor or a nurse, she said. And I remember telling my sister, oh, maybe I could be a chemist. Um, Prince decided to come back another day, quote, when I looked better. Um, and although one of her teachers at Wisconsin Lutheran urged her to call um, and make an appointment to talk to someone at Alfridge, she said she was just too shy and nervous to do that. And she hung up once the uh, call went through. Instead, she returned to the plant intending to drop off a letter in which she requested such a meeting. Trying to work up the nerve to go inside, Prince noticed a woman standing in front of the building whom she would come to call Miss Helen. I told her I was a high school student who wanted to talk to someone about what chemists did and how to become one. Helen took Prince inside and set up an appointment for her to come back and observe one of Aldrich's chemists at work. Recalled Prince, I was terribly nervous and she made me feel very, very welcome. She was so nice and genuine and had such a warm smile. When you're 15, that means a lot. Um, she did go back and work with an, an Aldrich chemist. She went on um, to uh, become the first black student at UWM to complete the school's medical technology program. She worked um, for almost 20 years um, in hematology. Um, and the big, the big takeaway she, uh, she told me, uh, she took from that interaction with Helen was that, um, and this is something that she, she said she herself has tried to emulate all her life. You never realize the effect you can have on someone's future. So I, I love that story. Um, Deirdre, could you talk for a minute about um, how marrying Alfred was a mark of um, what I believe you told me was, was her independence and her, her open-mindedness. Right, well, um, you know, again, now that doesn't seem quite so earth shattering, although it still breaks norms today. But uh, back when Helen became engaged to Alfred Bader, uh, some shockwaves went through <laughs> not only the family, but um, probably the, you know, city of uh, Aberdeen, the little town of Aberdeen, the folks that would have known the family hearing about this because Helen was raised as a Christian in the Christian faith and to go fall in love and determine to marry and set on a life path with someone outside of her faith, not only that, but to um, be devoted to, to converting and, and raising her family as Jewish um, in the Jewish faith and to be devout, a devout Jew, to become a devout Jew. It, it was just, uh, it's, it's um, again, it's pretty, pretty surprising looking back for the context of the time. Yep. It, it certainly took the parents a, a beat or two to, to kind of come around, but they met Alfred and the hard sell, um, our grandfather Lloyd Daniels, who had a certain love and uh, respect for everyone, uh, he, would not, he would have been the soft sell and he was devoted to his daughters. He wanted them happy. Jesse, Jesse would have been the hard sell, but Jesse recognized in Alfred Bader a meeting of the minds in that they both were fiercely intelligent and she was very impressed by him. It would have been impossible not to be impressed by Alfred Bader as you, as you laid out so well. And so they came around and uh, welcomed, welcomed their new, new son-in-law into the family. But it was always an interesting relationship. Jesse, Jesse loved to match wits with people. Uh, she did it with my husband year, many years later when she was at the end of her life. 
Um, she loved nothing better. So Alfred would have been a formidable mm -hmm. uh, partner in that dynamic. And then of course, six years into their marriage um, with Aldrich up and running, um, Helen and Alfred are delighted, overjoyed when um, David, you're born in 1958 and Dan is born in 1961. And again, defying tradition all the time, um, Helen continued to work part-time at Aldrich while assuming most of the work of raising um, you guys, uh, in large part because your father was so focused, as you mentioned earlier, on the business. Uh, yes, traveling abroad for weeks at a time. Um, by all accounts, Helen loved being a mother. And I uh, was particularly struck by the stories that you and your brother told, David, um, about your parents' differing uh, parenting styles and how much your home life changed uh, when your father left town on, uh, on those trips. Um, could you talk about that, David? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, uh, woohoo, that's gone. So we would go out to eat like every night. Uh, my mother very much I wanted us to be who we were, not who my father wanted us to be, who he wanted us to be. And um, and we relaxed a lot. So when my father was home, I mean, obviously we helped with the, the, the cooking and we helped pack the paintings and we helped hang the paintings and we helped whatever other projects were going on that he was focused on. Plus every now and then he would make me learn a hot Torah for synagogue and he would make Daniel shine his shoes and uh, clean his car. And there are always things that had to happen. I mean, it was kind of like having the business at home and my parents would talk business through dinner while my mother served dinner and my dad would be done eating dinner by the time my mother sat down to eat dinner. And um, it was all very intense when that was going on. And then he would leave and we would, I think, live a, a much more normal life in, in the house. And, um, and that went on as long as we were in the house. That's right. So. Mm -hmm. And Deirdre, what do you recall of your relationship? I remember you telling me that Helen, especially, was really good at establishing relationships with, with, with you and each of your brothers. What do you remember about um, your interactions with her? Well, they were, we were living in a different city by that point. We were, the, the two sisters' families did overlap in Milwaukee for a period of a handful of years or so. But when I was a little girl, we moved away and um from then on for all the years after that and helen would occasionally come to come for a visit we'd we'd see her from time to time um on her way to or from somewhere europe something right, right. and um and and those were special those were special visits so it was kind of helen would come blasting in with her interesting cosmopolitan, you know, uh, aura, <laughs> European traveler and so forth. And, and she did, she had a real knack for seeing people. I, I think I have meant, may have mentioned this before, but she, she had a way of making you really feel seen as a person. Uh, that's why I love that episode you related in the book, Priscilla, of Joan Prince's experience. Oh, right. Helen, Helen saw each person individually. She did see that I had an interest in art and get, gifted me with a little, out of the blue, I mean, it wasn't a regular thing, a little Rembrandt book, which I had for many years. And my youngest brother, she understood boys very well and she saw that he loved go-karts and, and he's, he remembers to this day that it was very memorable that she gave him a book on go-karting encouraged him in that, which I'm not sure how my parents felt about that, by the way, but <laughs> he, you know, uh, he was uh, thrilled, thrilled. So yeah, she was, she was special. She, she really saw you, even though she was, you could tell she was very busy and she was always on the go. She did take time to see each one of us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the 70s, uh, I think were particularly difficult years for Helen. Uh, for one thing, you and uh, your brother David were teenagers. Um, but beyond that, family life was upturned by, by the middle of the decade when your father reconnected with Isabel Overton, which was a woman um, with whom he had fallen in love 25 years earlier, uh, but had refused to marry him because she was a devout Protestant and, and uh, just didn't think she'd be able to raise her children in the Jewish faith. And um, truth be told, even though your father's marriage to your mother had been very happy and fulfilling in many ways, um, Alfred had been carrying a torch for Isabel all those years. Mm -hmm. And Helen had kind of accepted that. Um, but the fact that they were now back in touch uh, was devastating. And she decides to make some big changes in her life. In January, 1980, she returns to graduate school at UWM um, in her fifties, um, which uh, shocks almost everybody who knows her. She, she um, leaves Aldridge, um, this is a big deal. Uh, and she announces that she's gonna study social work. And then that December, she tells your father she wants a divorce. By uh, the summer of 1981, the divorce is final and Helen has earned a master's in social work. Um, and she begins a short but fulfilling career at the Milwaukee Jewish Home, where she works with Alzheimer's uh, patients. Um, and she educates the, herself and the staff about Alzheimer's, which at that point, this is the early 80s, um, is just becoming to be recognized as the uh, most common cause of dementia in adults. Um, I was struck by two things. How well she was able to rise above the pain that Alfred had caused her and the way she went on to thrive, something that your father, Deirdre, had, had predicted. Um, Helen was very close um, to your father as well. And I just wanna read, um, I just wanna read um, one last excerpt here. Um, and this is following, um, following the, the divorce. In the end, as Dick DeBay had predicted, Helen was able to rise above and emerge from the pain Alfred caused her, a feat that did not go unnoticed. Marvin Klitzner, who was, um, a, uh, Marvin and Jane Klitzner, who were great family friends, and actually Marvin handled the divorce for both Helen and, and um, Alfred, that's how close they were. Marvin credited Helen for the classy way she handled the divorce. She knew and understood that we continued to be friends with her ex-husband. Nevertheless, she found it in her heart to continue to be close intimate friends with us, he said. I don't think she had an ounce of resentment in her system. His daughter, Francie Wolf, noted that although divorce was not unheard of or necessarily frowned upon in the Jewish faith, it was somewhat unusual for a couple to divorce after decades of marriage. I would say I was proud of her, said Wolf, for facing a man and saying, I want out. Rabbi Peter Mailer, rabbi of the synagogue in Sheboygan, Helen joined in the early 80s, noted that unlike the ill will and bitterness that often characterized life after divorce, Helen wanted to live her life free of anger and animosity and wanted her sons to be engaged by a sense of warmth and love. Um, I think that says a lot about, about Helen. Um, David, so, okay, so why social work? Why go back to school in social work? Uh, great question. Let's see. We're riding down the street. We are kids in the station wagon, I assume. My dad is driving, and we're driving by the orphanage, on which is now where St. Mary's is, State Orphanage or something. They and my father said, points and says, that's the orphanage. And he's going, what's that? And he explains, and he says, your mother wants to help those people someday. So, and that was the end of it. So, um, I kind of never forgot that, but we were so busy with our life and our museum and our frenetic life that I described earlier. Um, Mom had a need to help people and that was clear in the work she did even at Aldridge. And it was clear in my brother and my upbringing, we always needed special help for something and she always got it for us. So she was good at getting people resources to grow. And that's why I think she 
decided that she was going to be a social worker and be a, a, a woman of her own destiny. And I think as a family, we always worked. She wasn't the wife that just kind of said goodbye to her husband in the morning and he came back. There was a, what have you done productively today sort of experience of the family and um, that I still try and live by. And, um, and so she wanted to contribute and she thought social work was something she could do. Obviously she had means at that point. So um, she really could contribute in a, in a bigger way than maybe just the person with a master's degree. I guess I want to add that a lot of the women at the synagogue also in their 50s went and got more advanced degree a lot. Anyways, I can think of three that went at the same time as my mother and got advanced degrees. So it wasn't totally unheard of that um, women in their 50s were going to go back and make a difference in the world in, those, in, the, in the late 70s. Well, and of course, in, in retrospect, it makes it makes perfect, perfect sense. Um, Deirdre, again, we're talking about, uh, you know, some moves here that took a lot of courage, um, particularly, you know, in, in, in that day. Um, you know, your thoughts on that. And then you also, um, I know, have some memories of, of Helen as a student. Right. Well, I think it was I think I was in high school, as I remember it, because I'm, I'm picturing which dining room <laughs> would have. But as we were getting ready for bed, my Aunt Helen was on one of her not very frequent visits, but a visit. And she was had a couple big books with her. And I thought, what is that? And I think she was studying German. Now, you Mm -hmm. That could be. My, my cousins could correct me on this, but I seem to remember her saying, just kind of laughing it off and saying, but I, that was the first time I, it struck me that what she's already, um, she's already very successful in life, right? She's married. She has these, she's raised a family. She started a company. She's why in the world is she choosing to study something at her age? um when you when you, you know you're well out of school you don't need to do that anymore and then a few years later when i heard she was going back for an advanced degree i was astounded because i had my my own undergraduate degree by that point and was working and it, the the last thing i could imagine anyone choosing willingly voluntarily to do was have a passion to go back to school subject yourself to that again i couldn't I couldn't believe it. And I, I think that took, it took courage. It had to take courage uh, to, just to envision uh, a, another path forward for herself that she would do on her own. I, uh, I, I thought that was tremendously brave. And of course, no discussion of, um, Helen's life would be complete without exploring, um, which the book does, the, the Bader family's Jewish faith and links over the years to the local Jewish community. Um, as has been mentioned, Helen's conversion to Judaism, Alfred's decades of Sunday school teaching, um, Dan and David's two summers in Israel as very young boys, uh, Helen's work at the Milwaukee Jewish home and um, the creation of its Helen Bader Center and the, the Helen Bader Foundation's commitment to, to Jewish causes. Um, David, can, can you talk a little bit about what you remember about your summers in Israel and how those experiences might have shaped you? Yeah, uh, at age, well, this is probably the year after the Six Day War. And I think I'm going from like nine to 10 years old. And my, and we were sort of leaders and we, my father, my, my parents traveled obviously. And so then this became a pattern. My brother and I were shipped off places in the summer to learn something in some foreign country, which started in Israel. And we stayed at relatives of some other Holocaust survivors from Vienna that were friends of my father's and we saw Israel when it was 
two million people. Right now it's like nine million people. And it had just won the Six Day War. And things were kind of raw and very exciting. And um, we learned a lot about Zionism and we learned we were we were we were proud to be part of it. My mother had to take us there because my father was too busy. And um, we flew on an L L flight out of New York that was 12 hours late. And then she remorse, she she kind of sadly left us there. I don't know how long we were there. I'll say six weeks or something like that. And then we flew home alone. And we had learned Hebrew and we wore yarmulkes all the time. The neighbors didn't like that much. And we did that again the next year. And it was just such a different life from our life in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And um, things were in Israel very like safety oriented and defense oriented and People were struggling just to have enough money, um, and the, in, the entire nation was was struggling on. And my parents were so proud of of Israel and its its being, and that they had gotten Jerusalem back as as Jews. And we went to see all these amazing things in Israel. Um, and of course, we went to Jerusalem, and we went up to Akko, and we went all around Israel. So we came back with a whole different worldview. And I'd say we were early. Daniel and I were early because this is right after the the Six Day War. And I don't think it was fashionable for Jewish families to send their kids to Israel before then. And of course, it became very fashionable or the thing to do later to for children or kids to get attached to Israel. But uh, we were pioneers in the true sense. And um, by the time we were done being shipped off to Israel, our friends were going to Israel, and uh, my brother and I were being shipped off to Germany to learn uh, German, yes, and how chemical companies work in Europe. So that was my synopsis. Um, Deirdre, could you put on your hat as a um, your board member hat, member of the board of what was the Helen Bader Foundation and now Bader Philanthropies, and um, talk a little bit about the support of Jewish causes um, from the Helen Daniels Bader Jewish Education Fund and the Scholarship Fund in, in particular over the years? Right. Well, you've already mentioned the Helen Bader Center at the Milwaukee Jewish Home, which is now the Ovation right. Communities, of course. Correct. Right. Uh, which was a, a big, uh, big commitment early on in the history of the Helen Bader Foundation. And another major gift program that we established, were able to do was in the late 90s, we began uh, making a major gift of up to a million dollars a year over a period of 10 years to the Helen Bader Scholarship Fund to fund Jewish schooling in Milwaukee and to create an endowment. And today that endowment stands at $13 million. And currently in this school year alone, 660 students are receiving assistance from the Helen Daniels Bader uh, endowment for Jewish education in the city of Milwaukee. And that is students from six schools in Milwaukee. So that's a wonderful achievement and legacy yes. to Helen and to her support of that community. After all, both both the Bader, both Baders as boys went through the Jewish school system. So Jewish schools attended them. So it's nice to be able to support them ongoing. Um, I'll just mention that, that such philanthropy was very important to Helen. And um, in the last years of her life, she had engaged in private anonymous philanthropy, um, which, was, which was what led uh, in 1989, um, well, she went at, at following her death in 89, led to the foundation of the Helen um, uh, Bader Foundation. Establishment of it, yes. Yeah, right. And, and which is now, of course, Bader Philanthropies. Um, I love that the title of the book includes that word, quiet. Um, 
I, I'm, I, I really appreciate humble people. And um, the word quiet, I think, applies here not only because of Helen's private philanthropy, but also the fact that she was so unassuming that even people who knew her really well uh, were shocked at the time of her death um, mm -hmm. to learn that she was, in fact, a wealthy woman. Um, Obviously, as you noted, Deirdre, the work of the foundation, um, including the renaming of the School of Social Welfare at UWM uh, in 2001, speaks, speaks to, um, to Helen's legacy. But beyond that, I, I guess I'd like to know what each of you um, hopes readers take away from, from your mother's story um, in terms of her legacy and her life. David? Uh, it's very brief. Um, be creative and definitely take you know, act on what life offers you. And it's, it's going, it's passing you by and something you want to act on, act. Um, share and emphasize, em, emphasize, em, empath, empathize mm -hmm. with those around you and give back when you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deirdre? Oh, I just, uh, I, I love the, the arc it's wonderful the arc that you established in the book, Priscilla, for us of the earliest days of Helen's ancestors and the context of that all the way through her life, including her legacy uh, with her philanthropy, her philanthropy. But I think back and, you know, Helen's mother, Jessie, we've spoken about her. She's so, she was a beautiful seamstress hand sewing oh, and um, her work was very well known in her circle. So she dressed up her two daughters in beautiful outfits, head to toe with matching hair ribbons, the whole works. The minute they were out the front door, Helen was tearing her hair ribbon off, throwing it on the ground. She wanted to put on her dungarees, go off on her bike, didn't want to do any of the things that maybe grandmother had set up for her. She was a tomboy. She went away to school. She married outside her faith. She was an equal partner to her husband, starting a company from scratch. And then she broke away after all of that and created this whole new adventure for herself. If that isn't pioneer spirit, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what is. So the legacy of that, of her personal example, I'm so grateful for, but the legacy of that carried larger over the community of Milwaukee and beyond in her work as a philanthropist, but also through funding the Helen Bader Foundation, which is now Bader Philanthropies formed the nucleus of that is a, a wonderful, a wonderful legacy for all of us. And I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. Well, it's, 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 I've, I'm honored to have done it. I, I think it's wonderful to put um, a, a face on a name. Everyone knows the Bader name in Milwaukee, but now I hope the book will help more people get to know Helen Daniels Bader. Mm -hmm. So th thanks, Patty. I think it's time to bring you back in if, um, if I've got this right. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Priscilla, Dan, David, Deirdre. Um, it was a fascinating journey through your mother's life. Um, if you have questions now, please put them in the chat. But to get it started, one of the things that really hit me is, is your mom and aunt seemed like such a lifelong learner. Um, and she was seemed to be at the cutting edge while so that going back to school in your 50s wasn't common, but she did it because she wanted to learn and make a difference. Or marrying outside your faith wasn't taboo, but it wasn't common. If you could talk just a little bit about, was she an envelope pusher? And also about her love for learning. Mm -hmm. An envelope pusher. Um, apparently, she was an envelope pusher. It wasn't really apparent to me that she was an envelope pusher at the time. I mean, 
she was very into a, at least me finishing my degrees and getting all my certifications. So basically finishing what you started, that's that was an important thing. Um, learning things and studying was just a family trade. It was a very academic household and there were always academics coming and we were always learning things. Every one of us was learning things on some way, in some way. Um, we all kind of learned in parallel. It was just like a small university. And we didn't really do things as a family often together, but maybe have dinner. Um, and then everybody would break out to what they did. And, um, <clears throat> and I would do my thing and my brother would do his thing and my mother would do her thing and my dad would do his thing. And you two, my dad would drag us in to look at a painting. Um, so that sort of describes, so when obviously if you learn, I, my mother was always reading a book, always reading a book. There's always a new book and always some friend that she had that was reading, she was reading the book with and she was talking about it. So there was just a constant, I'd say high level churning of learning that was going on. And that, does that explain things? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're learning things all the time. You're obviously gonna go right out of the envelope because that's what academics do. Well, and Deirdre, you mentioned that Helen um, was studying German, which she decided to learn on her own. She took, as I understand it, a couple of college classes because she wanted to be able right. to speak um, conversationally with many of the German um, scientists right. uh, who came to Milwaukee to uh, do business with um, Alfred. Yeah, I'm sure that helped. I, my, my, my sense of this is that her, her, uh, her ability to innovate in her own life, those steps seem to come out of who she, who she was. So it seems to me that it was all grounded in the kind of person she was from a little girl. You know, we mentioned that she was a tomboy, that she uh, learned empathy from her father, that she, I, I think, I think, I think all of her uh, innovative decisions in her own life seem like an outgrowth of the kind of person that she really was fundamentally. And that's the best way to innovate or push the envelope, seems to me. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that came in is um, an audience member would like to understand more about her role at Ovation and, um, and her work with Alzheimer's, um, people with Alzheimer's. Well, um, I can tell you that um, though her career was short, she was on the cutting edge of researching um, best practices for people with dementia. And she took herself to international national conferences on Alzheimer's, which as I said, was just emerging um, during that time. And uh, she, she did, she instituted um, uh, well, for instance, she, she was renowned for dancing with the Alzheimer's patients on her floor, which is music and, and art and dance and all of those things are now recognized as, as very appropriate therapies. But at the time, this had never been done before. And so again, I think it was instinctual um, as both David and Deirdre, you've, you've uh, alluded to. Um, she, just, she just kind of figured out what these people needed and was able to find a way to give it to them. Um, so I can add to that. Um, I mean, my mom's empathy was her one of her amazingly strong points, and she encouraged. I think in in, in Alzheimer's disease, people need to be encouraged to be the best they can with the re with the resources that they have, and um, and that was something that she did naturally. So she would engage with different people on their different levels, find out what really made them tick in a deep level. And a lot of those memories are still in those people. So then she would get them to experience that and smile. Um, the health system in the United States is often governed by insurance companies, and they don't want people to fall over and break their arms. And so people that aren't 
have Alzheimer's in those days were often stuck in a wheelchair. And um, I think soon after my mother's departure from this planet, I did go to Holland and, re and they had they had national health care, obviously they had facilities where people were encouraged to be themselves. They would start new relationships because they didn't remember who they were married to because a spouse wouldn't be in the facility, for instance. Um, and they would fall over, but they were happy. And I think that that said, we're a little bit more on my mother's mindset, like you got to live each day with what you have and what's beautiful to you. And that makes you happy. And that's the way you should live your life. And that's the way my mom really kind of worked with the people at the Jewish home. There's quite, a, there's quite a lot, uh, Priscilla, you have a, a lot of good material in the book about the very early days when Helen was sort of enticed <laughs> over to work there and how that all got started. That's a, that's a great story in the book. It's several pages, so I'm not going to summarize it, but. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers, right? You have to read the book. <laughs> Well, we're getting lots of uh, thank yous. People are really grateful for the insight into, into Helen. Um, I do want to remind you all that if you'd like your copy of the book, um, there is a link in the chat, or you can email Cassie S at milwaukeejewish.org and we'll make sure to get you one. Um, thank you again, everyone. Uh, this was very enlightening as a longtime Milwaukeean and a person who works in the Jewish community. We're so grateful for the legacy of Helen Daniels Bader and the Bader Philanthropies. Um, this has been a real joy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And then I just want to remind everyone that the Jewish Museum is open. Our current exhibit is to Paint is to Live with generous support from Bader Philanthropies. Um, if you, we have a few programs coming up that you might enjoy. One is Ghetto Chronicles with historian Sam Cassow, and he will be talking about of the difference in the Jewish ghettos during World War II, in particular, the uh, Wuch ghetto and Theresienstadt, which our current exhibit is about. We also have Phil Hands, a cartoonist, political cartoonist, who's going to go through his craft um, from the Wisconsin State Journal. So we hope you can join us for those. And as always, if you've enjoyed this program, or any of our other programs, please feel free to make a donation and the link is in the chat. <laughs> Thank you all. We so appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.